Hi, I'm Nick Sadler from Scent of a Woman and a few other films, and you're listening to Monday Morning Critic Podcast. As I came in here, I heard those words, cradle of leadership. Well, when the bow breaks, the cradle will fall, and it has fallen here. It has fallen. Makers of men, creators of leaders, be careful what kind of leaders you're producing here. I don't know if Charlie's silence here today is right or wrong. I'm not a judge or jury, but I can tell you this. He won't sell anybody out to buy his future. And that, my friends, is called integrity. That's called courage. Now that's the stuff leaders should be made of. Now I have come to the crossroads in my life. I always knew what the right path was. Without exception, I knew, but I never took it. You know why? It was too damn hard. Now here's Charlie. He's come to the crossroads. He has chosen a path. It's the right path. It's a path made of principle that leads to character. Let him continue on his journey. You hold this boy's future in your hands, committee. It's a valuable future. Believe me, don't destroy it. Protect it. Embrace it. It's going to make you proud one day, I promise you. In the Wild West world of podcasting, there is one podcast that is authentic and genuine and continues to stand tall in its originality. Based on a passion for his guests, their work, and his love of podcasting, Derek Thomas and Monday Morning Critic Podcast get amazing, diverse, unique guests found nowhere else. The variety and quality are endless. There is something for everyone. Derek Thomas is the hero you deserve. He's a silent guardian, a watchful protector. Welcome to Monday Morning Critic Podcast. Here is Derek Thomas. My next guest's filmography includes Hellraiser, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, Twister, True Grit, Mobsters, and my personal top five, one of the best movies ever made, and I'll fight anybody that says otherwise, Scent of a Woman. Please welcome Nick Sadler. Nick, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Uh, well, thank you, Derek. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here and talk with you. Yeah, and I, I, I say actor, but quite truthfully, you've done consulting, you've done directing, you've done filmmaking, you're a writer, you're a teacher, so... Uh, for, for for lack of a better word, I will say you are much more than just an actor. Oh, thank thank you. That would uh, make uh, make my wife and son uh, very very proud to proud to hear that. That's, I'm not just putzing around the house most days. Hey, uh, Nick, how long were you in Minnesota for? I know you're born there, you're raised there. How much time do you spend in in Minnesota? Um, you know, obviously you. You have a very impressive. Um, even before you get to Juilliard, you're you know you 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 really have a passion for movies and acting. How long you spend in Minnesota? Um, yeah, it, that's a great question. Um, pre pre pandemic, um, it, I look at it in in chapters. The last the last couple of years, travel has really been prohibitive, so it hasn't been much at all, sadly. But um. You know, obviously, growing up, I was I was there until I graduated high school. And then I was I was fortunate to move to New York to go to school, and then I would try to spend as much with my summers as possible back. And then I tried to continue that even after, um, you know, I was lucky enough to be working and having my days and weeks rather full. That when I would get a break, I would try to get back at least for, I don't know if you can, I don't know in terms of days, but I would at least try to get back for at least a week, if not longer with, with every season. Um, because I, I did, I found something just truly, truly special about Minnesota with every season that there was just something about how it moves from summer to autumn, the way that it just drops into winter. And there's just, there's just nothing like Minnesota in the, in the winter um, it's just, it's just, I, I find it to just be stunning. And, and then obviously spring and summer, and there's nothing like being in Minnesota in the summer with all the lakes and 
and all the activities to do. And also I've been fortunate enough that I have a really strong group of friends that have been my closest friends since middle school. Wow. And there's about, there's about four of us. And through a lot, a lot of life, you know, we still are able to, um, you know, stay in touch and pick up. Um, the last couple of years have been harder just because travel has been restricted. Um, but it's always been nice. It's probably a long answer to, to a good question. Um, but I, I, for the most part, I try to get back a lot. My family is still there. My closest friends are still there. I, I, I enjoy getting back, you know, as, as often as, as I can. And it's, you know, it's just a great, it's a great state. And it's also just, it's a, both Minneapolis and St. Paul are just great arts communities and they just have wonderful, you know, wonderful theater venues and music and just, a, just across, across the board. I've, I've just always been just a huge fan and supporter of everything that, that people are doing in Minnesota. Yeah. And, you know, we're working our way to, to, to your, you know, your current uh, career. Um, were you the kid that always was, you know, had a lively imagination? Like um, what were some of the, and, and this is a common answer. I'm sure you've gotten this hundreds of times, if not thousands. Um, you, you know, you strike me as the kid with the lively imagination when you were younger and, you know, um, what were the influences as far as television or acting or movies? Um, just elaborate with whatever you're comfortable with. Oh, sure. Um, oh gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say, yeah, I very much had, I was very much in my, my head and the things that I could create in there pretty, you know, pretty early on. Um, I've got two younger brothers and when we weren't playing, I would spend a lot of time where we grew up was kind of out and it was, it abutted a, a horse farm and we could kind of go out and, and just make up stories and just create, create adventures. And, and so we would go from, Oh man, it was, hmm. you know, I'm trying to think of like, like something that's super specific. Like I remember, my grandfather giving me a set of like the wonderful world of Disney had these collections of like imagination books. They were like encyclopedias, like mm. what the world of tomorrow is going to be or just learning things. And I remember I would like look through those and then try to, and then like think of, think of stories and, and go, God, that would be, that would be so cool to do, you know? And I just, I remember silly things like I was a huge fan of, of Planet of the Apes and not just the movie. I still remember the first time I saw the movie. And now th you must know this about me. Unfortunately, it's like, I will digress like nobody's business because I'll just ping about. And I just realized, I just remembered like the first time I was able to stay up and watch back when there was no platforms or cable or DVRs or anything where you just had to watch what was on when it was on Yeah, was that the original RKO King Kong was on and it was channel 11 and that was WTCN and it was the midnight show. And I remember being, I think I was nine and my folks letting me stay up to watch it. That was going to be the big, the big deal. And we got to make popcorn <laughs> and I was just, absolutely just enthralled by that and i was just taken by the special effect that just this it was so it, it was it was just mind-blowing to watch i was just completely wrapped up in the in that world and i remember then buying um there was a great collection of like books that was douglas um oh gosh because i know there was the star log magazine and then there was also um douglas um who did the special effects for oh it's not copeland because that douglas copeland that's that's hitchhikers um but i remember reading like how do you do special effects and reading is like oh this is how you could make a story and i was always kind of bouncing around like that i just i always loved science fiction but then i always just loved making making other things up on on my own, we had kids on our circle and we would write plays together and put them on in the garage and we would charge a penny mm. and we'd have like the neighbors, we'd have the neighbors come. So I, it's like, I always just loved doing 
doing that and had friends who loved doing that. I was also very fortunate to, to grow up where they had an excellent public school system and they had a fantastic arts program and was really supportive. And so some of my first heroes as actors that I got to see in person, aside from like at the Guthrie, which was a real, um, a real foundational place for me was um, the high school theater. And I looked up to those actors and I was just always just awe stricken. Where I was just like, maybe I'll have a shot. Like when, when I'm quote unquote big, I'll be able to be on that high school stage and, and I'll get to maybe be as good as what I'm seeing these big kids do. Mm. And that, that, that animated my imagination and drive um, very, very much so. And then being lucky enough to have um, parents who would take me in to the city so that we would go to the Guthrie, we'd go to the cricket theater, we would go um, and really exposed to local actors. So it was, it was an interesting, uh, what's the right word? is um, that I had a, a very fortunate experience of being inspired by what I would see, like watching on the television box or going to the movies or the drive-in, but then also being able to see theater in person and seeing people that, that are human that I could, I could connect with. And I knew that they, they lived in proximity, like the high school kids, like I could see them and they go, my gosh, you guys were so, so amazing and to know that when i would go to the guthrie and see like richard ohms or a ken ruda and and know just how fantastic they are and and read their biographies and how did they do this and all these theater companies and all these opportunities so i I was very fortunate to just see not just in this oh my gosh there's this other land or this other place where you could go and do this i could also see that it was right there in my front yard in my backyard as as well so i was like fortune is just the word that keeps coming back of just that it was just kind of all around me i was just lucky enough to listen to it and and say yeah i would this is something that fulfills me and even before thinking about as a as a career knowing that that was kind of like the things that made me happy, even though I also was like, you know, I was a sports kid. You can't grow up in Minnesota without ice skating. I mean, I was on skate. I was 18 months old. We were out, you know, out on the lake and then, you know, playing hockey and being one of those like rink rats and all that. Um, But, you know, but just knowing that the creative stuff was always, you know, making things, however that was, was the thing that gave like happiness and, and kind of contentment and, purpose before you even know like how to articulate those things because you're just doing it because it's fun you're just a, it's you're just a kid in a knucklehead and it makes you happy <laughs> yeah that's that's well said and you, you know you're um obviously you go from minnesota to juilliard uh nick what makes i mean i i know the answer but i but i kind of want to hear it from you what makes juilliard so special um i think I think what makes I, I think Juilliard is special, um, and I know uh, I think it's I think the the thing that makes Juilliard really singular is that it's it's a special experience in its own very specific unique way for everyone who goes through the program, mm. um, and I think that there is obviously the the mystique of the name. And that gives it, without kind of knowing what it is, that it 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 represents, um, you know, a, a continuation of an institute of excellence. You know, from the, the music to the dance to obviously drama and and how the the drama division has has continued to evolve over the years. Um, that it it just. I know growing growing up and then even just for late persons who don't know it's um you know it's a it's a word that means like excellence and it's like it's also if you kind of think about of like kind of foreboding of like who goes there you know what I mean mm. it's like it's a shorthand for oh it's that other thing that's that's over over there and so just to be able 
to be fortunate enough to to actually be accepted there, you're you're crossing this transom of just like what? I, it's like <laughs> nobody goes there. You just you you know this thing exists, and if you're in New York, you know it's at Lincoln Center. You know it's that that white you know that that building with whatever that that odd '60s marble is on the outside of it. Um, and so it specifically, and it's, it's, it's a really interesting question because it's, and one of the reasons I think, I think that it's so different is that each department and discipline really requires something very personal and challenging in its dynamics of how it challenges your, your talents and, and ambitions and ideas about yourself. And then in the randomness of who you are then with as you go through this learning experience and knowing friends of mine who were going through the music department where it was, there was a very much a, an, an individual, there was a very specific, very kind of lonely journey in many ways because of the way that you had to study specific to your, your craft that then would put itself within a larger context, possibly within an orchestra or a quartet, but a lot of that were moving towards being soloists. And that was different than the approach of the collaborative and what you would have to do to reach over in terms of trust and faith to be thrown together with, you know, when I went there, it was, we started with 20, 23 students from the age of like 17 to 25. And we graduated with 17 there. Cause that, when I went, they still did cuts after the second year. Wow. So it was this, it was this intensely personal, intensely competitive yet collaborative process, but you always felt the Damocles sword hanging right over you until midway through second year, when you would find out that you're not warned and you're not being cut and that at least your quote unquote future is assured for the next whatever 30 months the next two and a half years and but then prior to that it's just the 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 pressure and the amount of things that you go through and everybody responds to that differently i still have you know some of my you know three of my closest friends aside from my friends growing up in minnesota are the ones that i went to school with that were my 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 YMCA mates, um, cause before, before the dorms were built there, uh, one of the housing options aside from you live in New York, congratulations, you're going to Juilliard. Um, hmm. they would just make suggestions. They would have deals at a men's hotel on 103rd and Broadway and then the 63rd YMCA. And that was your dorm unless you could, you know, scrap and find, uh, find an apartment. And so our dorm was on the, on the ninth floor and, uh, and yeah, and, and Greg and Billy and David, we, you know, we formed like a really tight, tight group with, within that. And so it was like, it was like personal. It was like, cause you're in this very weird environment it, with a very small group of people. And you, you instantly realize that there's going to be a very small number of people that are going to understand what it is to spend the next four years with 23 to down to like 17 people that is supposedly, you know, you, you, you hope that that's going to help you have a career coming out, but that you are being exposed to this huge history and heritage of performance and exploration and, the people that have gone there before you and the teachers that have taught those people that you've looked up to. And now this thing is being passed on. So when you're working masks with Pierre Lefebvre and knowing who he worked with and you're doing movement with Mona Yakin and you realize the legacy of your work, you, you know, you have Michael Langham teaching you Shakespeare and I'm sitting there doing text study with Michael and it's just blowing my mind because it's like, you were just running the Guthrie and I would like, there was like, I can't talk to you. You were this thing so far away. <laughs> and now we're in this like tiny little room together. That's very intimate with like small group, you know, working and joking and creating these, these bonds and friendships. And it's, it's, it's really, ex 
you know, it's it's extraordinary, you know, and then it's hard to just to describe it from from the outside other than any other kind of lucky experience, a learning experience like that that's both personal and educational, that that you end up being in a place of such vulnerability because it's really the only way that it works is you've got to be vulnerable and, and risk and fail and hope that that failure doesn't lead to rejection and isolation and, and mess with your head, that you're in a very accepting place and you you grow from it instead of just hating yourself all the time because you're just having so much thrown thrown at you it's almost impossible to process and even when they keep telling you look you're not gonna this a lot of the stuff you won't get until like years later on but who wants to hear that when you're 18 years old hmm. you want it to mm-hmm. you want it to work yeah and there are things that all of a sudden you know i still find now it's like oh i i understand that now I understand kind of breathing in center in a different way. I, I understand like moments will just come come back. And then other stuff I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe they did things that way. It was, that was like so brutal. You know, it's so, I think it was just, it was just so intense in terms of its emotions and perceptions and, and it's, how would I, is, you know, it goes from like when I got accepted, People were like, oh, my God, you're going to the fame school. (laughs) Well, no, that's 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 LaGuardia High School. That's that's the that's the high school (laughs) high school. And then afterwards, you know, there's like, you know, that there's all these people that wanted to go to Juilliard and then they didn't. And it's just like, so what was it like? Or I went someplace else and you're awesome. But also because you kind of suck because you went to the place that I wanted to go. And then the then you meet all these people who are like so much better and so much like just amazing. But when you're younger, you think, Oh, this is what is going to be the marker. That's going to open all the doors as opposed to it's a profound experience that hopefully you can take, you can take lessons from since a creative field is just so darn random in so many ways, especially in terms of, um, I don't know, consistency of work and also um, the, what would I say? The, um, there's not, not always all the best work is the one that everybody sees, you know, and just in terms of like exposure and in, in, in scale. And that's always kind of a, a hard thing to learn to, to modulate and, and to learn just to focus on the work. You know, yeah. and 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 to continue with that lesson is just just focus focus on the work and and the rest will the rest will take care of it. Yeah, and, and you like know, you, take care of itself. Yeah, and you mentioned um uh, the seventeen people, and obviously Juilliard is is the place to be, well, well, the premier place to be. I would certainly say, in my opinion, um, in your class, are, are there any other? Uh, either whether they're friends of yours, well-known alumni that we w- that are still working today. Because I always feel like when I, when people talk when I've had guests that go to Juilliard, they say, "Well, I went in my class. There was this person, this person, this person." I'm like, "Oh, okay." Was that the case with you? Are there still people that were in your class that we that are still working today that are you know um, I, that that are that you know graduated with you or you know? It, it, oh, oh, yeah, no, very very much so. Um, is by my one of you know one of my closest friends, Bill Camp, he's been having a very good couple of years. Oh, he is um, a ph- he is a phenomenal actor, and he uh, the night of um, is one of his greatest work. Bill Camp is a phenomenal actor. Yeah, and one of the just greatest human beings. And you know, we instantly you know we became like just close like that the moment that we met. You know, because we were like three rooms down at the YMCA. And I remember one time we were such scrubs um, that we were just like wandering around. We were like, you know, trying to get to know New York and we saw Robin Williams and we ended up following him. We just were just <laughs> dying to see where he's going. Cause he, and then he stopped and he met up with somebody and he was talking with them and they kept walking. We walked, we walked down Central Park West to Central Park South. And then they kept going on Central Park South and we're what we just keep following and following. 
And then we're just, you know, we're so damn stupid. You know, we don't even realize that they're slowing down and then we're slowing down. And then all of a sudden we're absolutely just dead even with each other. (laughs) So like Billy and Robin are like right next to each other, you know, and this Robin just turns and is like, is there something you'd like to ask me? You know, and we're like, oh, my God, well, we're Juilliard and we just started and we're group 18 and, uh, you know, and it's like, well, you know, I'm, you know, I was group because I think at that point he was he was referring to himself as group eight because Robin was there twice and he just stopped. And we just had this amazing conversation with Robin. He's like, you know what? I've been thinking about Juilliard a lot. And he was there with um, a classmate of his that I fortunately I cannot remember what his name was. Um but off of that conversation, Robin was like, I, um, I think I should come back. I haven't come back to the school. I have these mixed feelings, but I should, I should come back. And he ended up coming back and giving a couple of talks Wow! and doing, and it was, a, it was amazing. And then I had found out later, um, there was, a there was a fund that if you were short on money for anything, you went up to, to Harold's office and he'd say, how much do you need? And he'd open up a drawer and he'd pull out some cash and he'd give it to you. And then finally later, it was, it was, it was Robin's fund. Robin would make sure that there was always enough money there at Juilliard for the students. Wow. And it was like never, you know, you always just found this out later. Um, again, see, I digress. I jump all over the place. Um, <laughs> but, Bill, but Bill Camp, you know, Bill Camp was in my class. Bill's having, you know, an amazing couple of years. John Hickey was um, was in my class. John's having an extraordinary time right now. Wow. Jane Adams, Jane, who just she won the Daytime Emmy for Hacks last year, mm-hmm. um, this last season. Um, Courtney Collins, who just did the prom on Broadway. Mm-hmm. Um, she was she was in our guys, Maury Nelson, who's doing a fantastic work out in Seattle. Um, with Seattle Rep and some other companies there. Um, David Atkins, who's an extraordinary actor, he um, just finished up this past summer. He was back up in um, in Massachusetts at, I want to say he was at Barrington, because he's done a lot of great work up there and in, 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 in New York. Um, my friend How- Howard Kay, he's out in Utah right now. He's doing um, He's doing the rep season out there. Um, I have to say like for our, our class, um, it was a, there's a high percentage of people that are still, um, that are still working. Yeah. I was going to say very, very impressive names you're naming off. Oh, great class. Yeah. Oh, and, oh, and also Lisa Gay, Lisa Gay Hamilton. Um, you know, Lisa's been doing extraordinary stuff. Lisa actually went back and directed a play, directed a third year production at Juilliard. I think it was three years ago. It was before everything shut down and got all upside down. Um, yeah, we, we, we had a, we've had a high percentage and it's interesting just, um, that I guess the, the gift of time gives you as well as a certain perspective of, you know, what is like work and like where it's profile is, you know, I think like Bill's like such a great example is, I mean, you know, he never really stopped working except for when he stopped because he just wanted to, you know, stop and reassess everything. But otherwise, you know, he's been doing extraordinary work in theater for years and ended up being one of those guys that, you know, film and television found him later. He kind of aged into a lot of the timber of his voice and the character of his soul and, and, and all of, all of that, you know, it's just, I think it's, it's always fascinating. It's, it's hard when you're younger starting out to try to understand kind of the potential arc of a career that there's going to be the perception of quiet time because it may not garner as much attention. And then all of a sudden these pockets that are feel like intensely um, visible, you know, and, and maybe in, in some ways more, more rewarding in certain certain respects um yeah i mean yeah and he amazing actor that you you're right you know certainly for, for some unknown reason found his um uh, niche late, later in life but just just a supremely talented um actor uh but before i get into your filmography i wanted to ask you 
Uh, truth to the fact that you were a bike messenger as well. <laughs> uh, that that is that is true. Okay. That is that is true. You've done my goodness. You've done your research. I don't even. Wanna... How did you find that out? Well, I, I have I have my 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 sources, but I have to say that is. I mean, you know, from the the kid from Minnesota going to Juilliard, I feel like is a a risk in itself, right? Because it's so competitive, you're really putting yourself out there. But I think bike messenger <laughs> bike messenger takes it to another level. Um, <laughs> you're literally risking your life every other minute, right? You're on the road. Uh, how long did that last for? And um, what, just tell me about that and anything you want to add. It was uh, <laughs> one just very impressive that you you um, you uh, you uncovered that you and James Lipton, um, you know, <laughs> kudos. Um, I I um, I did it for. Let's see. Gosh, it was about eighteen. I think it was about eighteen months, and wow. I I I'd always been a bicyclist, and I had done some longer biking. Um, in high school and um and i always and this was before biking became such a mode of transportation you know before city bikes and you know everyone like bike 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 it was kind of a it was a smaller slice when i first moved to moved to new york um, but it, I, it, to me, it was like perfectly natural of like a way to get around to avoid like, you know, because, you know, I'm just a scrub. I, mean, I, I can't afford a cab. And, you know, I, I was very precious about, you know, when I would use my subway tokens. This was even before, you know, Metro cards. So it made perfect sense for me always to, to ride around. And I, I found personally a certain wonderful freedom, especially at night, just cruising, this, cruising the streets, although I'm sure it was like ridiculously dangerous. There was something really freeing about it. So I felt comfortable in the environment doing it. Um, but when I graduated, I was, I was lucky that I was working, but, you know, through a mix of like, you know, doing, you know, readings and off, off Broadway, you know, doing those things, you know, it doesn't quite cover all of the bills. <laughs> and it was just a very random thing that I just saw in the village voice of like looking for bike messengers. And I found this place in the mid forties and I knew that it was a way that you could do it. And what I loved about it is like for the pay at the time, it was great because it, it had, um, it had zones going from midtown and then out, you know, both North and South, on Manhattan. And if you would get these longer runs, it would obviously cost the person who was ever asking for the delivery more money, but then your cut of what that was, um, was also higher. And, and so I just found that it was, it was a nice way to still kind of stay in shape and keep my head together. Um, and it allowed a real flexibility, you know, it's weird. You like you, this was still when you'd, you'd call in with pay phones <laughs> and you'd find out where your next thing, you know, where your next delivery was going to be. And if you're really lucky, you'd be going from like the Upper East Side to Wall Street because you'd be, these would be like these 75 to a hundred, $150 runs. And then if they were more like after hours. So, you know, I know that there were other friends that were, you know, like they were bartenders and, and waiters and those nights were just so long. And I just felt, fortunate that you know without like getting killed or hit by a door opening you know i was i was able to like cover my cover my overhead and still be able to get to auditions and do plays at night and 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 do that and and it was and and i liked that i kind of liked the rush of it i was never as crazy as there were these this group from trinidad and they were kind of known that they had stripped um the brakes off and they would just fly through. They were the fastest ones in the city. And you were also just, they're really nice, but they're super competitive. You didn't want to like get in the same lane as them. You know, you would see where different of these delivery companies, messenger services were using different, different bikers. And those guys were just like wicked fast. They were just crazy. Um, but I did that until um, I was cast in um, the doors 
And then I was going um, to uh, an extended time to Los Angeles to shoot that. Um, and I just let them know, cause you would just call in every day and just say, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, uh, you know, where do I go? You know, I'm on until you get at the end of the day or whenever you say, okay, I'm not available anymore. And so it was after I got that, I knew it was going to be in Los Angeles. I just said, I'm going to be off for a while. And then I just never went back after mm. that. I just uh, didn't, didn't have to, didn't have to hop back on the ride. Yeah, and you know, diving into your your filmography, I know one of your earlier entries uh, that's not listed is that you did voiceover work for I'm going to say it was an army commercial, very impressive stuff. Um, but oh, yeah. you, you know, but you know, the the one thing, and you and I are the same age. You might be younger, but I'm old enough to remember the importance of after school specials, and and I think that <laughs> I think that's your first entry, right? So. I feel like when people look at someone's filmography, they don't realize the importance of something at the time, right? So after school specials were enormous, right? You and I are talking earlier about, you know, um, you know net, now now it's Netflix and it's, everything's accessible. But, you know, after school specials at the time were huge, you know, big okay. numbers, a lot of people viewing. Um, talk a little about that, right? I mean, those things were huge at the time, right, Nick? They were. I, I mean, they were very formative. When I was um, when I was growing up, I I certainly I certainly remembered them. And things like right now, I would have to really sit back and think because right now it's just like it's this wonderful rainbow wash of I know that there were things that influenced me, <laughs> like I, it, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. Like, it's gotcha. just like, like not yeah. coming into focus, but it was it was like something that you know that everybody watched because it was always kind of dealing with something. You would end up talking about it you know, in, in one depth or, or another. And so certainly when, when I would, I got, now I'm, boy, now I'm going to have to start to think to see if I can remember it. <laughs> but but it was, it was um, a big, it was a big time in your life. It was a big time. In, I mean, it, it got the ball rolling for you, I think. I think so. Well, which which uh, which one was your favorite about? Do you, do you remember your after school special? Oh my was god, the there was so that? many. I mean, I, you know, they were they were all like learning moments, right, Nick? They're all like, yeah, you know, I, I'm trying to think what you could compare to today for for those listening. Um, I, I don't know. Like, I always felt like they they all had. It, it was almost like an Aesop's fables for like those the not eighties kids, <laughs> right? You know, it was almost like. There was all a bunch of like learning moments. That's one thing I have to go back and revisit. But I remember like they were a big part of growing up. They were a big part of of, of my childhood, right? You know, I the one you were in, um, uh, a town's revenge. I mean, I, I don't like town's revenge. Yeah, yeah. I don't specifically <laughs> remember it, but it's you know they were all like very like learning moments. But when we talk, when we step up a little bit, I was watching this today, and um, I think this is an all time classic. So underrated. Uh, stop or my mom will shoot. You have such a big scene. I could not stop laughing. Today. It was, I, I was rewatching it. You know, when somebody's ready to jump and take their life and then they're like, you know what? They go through the window and say, screw this. I'm done with it. Um, that's a huge moment for you, right? Because uh, joking aside, Sylvester Stallone, the the ageless, timeless Estelle Getty, um, you know, talk about that experience in your life, because that is one of those cult hidden classics that people really love. They gravitate to. But that's a big moment for you. It's early in the film. The focus is on you. You're handling your own. You're doing a phenomenal job up there. A pretty big moment for you, Nick, early on. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, and thanks for, you know, appreciating the, you know, the performance and, and also the context of the, you know, of the people that were, you know, involved, you know, because it was it was interesting because I, I had a great time with it, you know, because it's. It, it it was I so respected the um the people involved and it, and it was it was interesting because at that point um you know I'd been fortunate enough that I had done a number you know a number of projects so that uh, how would I um how would I put it is it was it was an interesting thing because there was you know my my reps weren't just like you know weren't totally crazy about it because it was like it you know from what I'd done is like do you really want to do this and it's just like 
just to your point, it's like, well, geez, it's, you know, it's Sylvester Stallone and, you know, it's Estelle Getty, who I just, you know, absolutely thought just the, you know, the, the world of. And, you know, and I really respected, you know, the director, Roger Spottiswood. And and I thought that this would be a, a lot of fun. And and Jackie Birch, who's the casting director. Um, I had her on the podcast. Me, I, I had she her always call me in. And I really like Jackie. Yeah. And I had a really fun time in in that audition. And and that was just that was one of the things that I just loved. I just had a fun time. And then when I got it, I was like, oh, my gosh. And then the experience itself of of shooting it um, was just great because Roger was was just wonderful and Sylvester because we did it like technically it was it, it was over a period of weeks because they they had the set built um, for some of the close ups and some of the the jumping actions on the back lot at Universal and then we actually shot. Um, at a building, I can't remember the name of the building. It was down on it was downtown Los Angeles. Um, I think it was Sixth Street. Because I remember when we went up to do it, and we were up like way up there, um, and they were doing the rigging. I was. It was right across the street from the building that we used as the hotel for mobsters, mm. and I could see. I could see the the fire escape that we shot out and out of that window. You know, so it's just like, oh, my God, I can see it's like I was not here, you know, not that long ago shooting that. And and here we here we are, you know, back doing back doing this. And and so it was interesting because because Sylvester was just he was really just really wonderful and just a great guy. And and, you know, it's interesting when you work with people that they're really good actors, they're very kind people. But they also carry this mantle of like they're a franchise, like they're the deal, you know, and some handle it better than others. And they know that it's like it's their show and it's on their shoulders and that there are responsibilities and, and pressures that go with that. And knowing that you have to when it's rehearsal time and when the cameras roll and you have a whole crew and you have these all these people here to support to create these moments that hopefully cut together that they put all of that out of their mind and they're present and giving in there for you and it, it just goes back to basics is that we're just having we're having fun and we're finding our moments and yeah. and let's see where this this goes yeah and that we, and we were able to do that but it's like we're absurdly doing that literally on a ledge where we have these support harness cables, you know, with like our wardrobe has holes cut in the back because, you know, we're wearing the vests with the steel cables to keep us from falling. And then those are bolted, you know, and I always kind of joke because I would look and see, am I, am I bolted in as much as Sylvester, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because they would bolt in and they would wrap around and then they had, they had, Four teamsters, like four of just the biggest guys that I've like ever seen. And then their job was to literally just sit there with it wrapped around themselves with like a weight belt almost. Yeah. And they're they were they were like last line of defense. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It, yeah. It's like we weren't on bungee cords, I think. It was like these steel, you know, these steel these steel cables. And so you're you're sitting here trying, okay, where's my because it was only like 15 inches off on that ledge. Right. And then it's just down. And they didn't, there wasn't because they were the reverse on it shooting up to get the sense of scale and the height. There was no, we didn't have a safety net underneath. This was all about if you went over, it's the steel cable, the I ring in the beam, and the two teamsters who are are literally, you know, holding on to your, your life through these cables. And, and then you forget about all of that. And you're actually kind of trying to work the scene as they're like working camera angles out through the window and then down and, and all of that. Um, so it's like, it was like thrilling because you're on one end, you're trying to block out. This is like absurdly terrifying and dangerous. And two is like, this is really just one of the, coolest things in the world i get i get this is what i get paid to do yeah this is this is where i can say this is what my my day is i'm i'm six stories or ten stories whatever the heck it was up 
you know, with Sylvester Stallone, who I've watched in, you know, from the Lords of Flatbush to Rocky. Yep. Yep. It's like, are you kidding me? You know, it's like First Blood is just like one of the best movies of like, of like all time. Sure. You know, it's just like, oh my God. Yeah. And, and we're sitting, being able to do this ridiculously, you know, funny scene and Roger being such a great, op- an open director and they have budgets like they did at that time. And Sylvester supporting it of, you know, we could play around with takes. We could improvise, you know, we, we had, we had a certain, um, we had a certain freedom there within the schedule that was really, that was really nice. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. And I want, I want to talk about something you said about, you know, the, deciding to take the role, but really quick, Jackie Birch has been on the podcast and oh. she, yeah, she's done a lot of the, she did a lot of the, for those listening, she did a lot of the casting for the John Hughes movies. She is, she's no joke. Like she's the real, like <laughs> the chances are, if you love the movie, even today, like she probably did the casting for it. Like, especially the eighties, nineties, she's still going strong. I mean, she is, She's really great at what she does. But getting back to something you said, and then I want to go with the, I have a few other questions that I want to ch- kind of jump into yeah. Scent of a Woman real quick. Um, you know, you, you know, you said you're, the reps kind of were like, you know, are you sure you want to do this? But come on. Like, if you think about it, though, Nick, if you told anybody the premise of almost any 80s movies, right? Take like Goonies or E.T. or Gremlins or any 90s movie. Like, the plots are insane, right? You don't know. Throw Mama from the train. You never know what works, what doesn't work. So... For you to take that risk, I think is huge, and it's a it's a good decision. It was a good decision in in, in the nineties, and it's a good decision in in twenty twenty one. Thank you, thank you. You know, thank you. Um, the other the, the two quick um observations I have in two of the um entries in your filmography. First of all, Twister. Um, I don't think I've had a person on the show as as beloved um from other guests that they've worked with as Bill Paxton in uh, Twist in yeah. Twister. Um, yeah. just a wonderful, wonderful human being, a great movie, yeah. by the way, and another great entry in your filmography. Yeah. And Bill was, Bill is a very, very close friend and it's, it, it, it still now doesn't, the universe doesn't make sense that he's not here. There's, there's, there's something fundamentally wrong with existence that I can't call him up or we can't hang out. Or that he's doing what he did in ways that nobody else could do. I mean, Bill was just, I mean, he, Bill was Bill and he was amazing and just such a good person. And, and yeah, I just, I, 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 I love Bill and I still get, I still get a, just even now I'm getting kind of a little numb because it takes me right back when I, when I heard the news yeah. of, of how he of how he passed because it was such a not Bill way to go like mm-hmm. you know Bill if Bill was going to pass it was going to be like you know T Bone Pickens you know <laughs> dropping out of an airplane yeah. riding yeah, that yeah, bomb yeah. down yeah, yeah. you know into into a volcano he was that you know something more like more like that. Um, but yeah, Bill is extraordinary. So you you did you 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 uh, you 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 did you did one with Bill. That's awesome. No, no, not not with Bill, but a lot of people yeah. that were very close to Bill, like you were, that that okay. that talk about him the same way you talk about him now. They were very, um, very complimentary of like, almost the exact word for words for what you're saying. Like the the gone too soon. The the the. The guy that just stood out above the rest as being just such a good, you know, forget the how talented he was, forget that, like the the person he was, right? It's a very rare combination of of both that he was effective in both areas. So yeah, they said a lot of what you said. And the other um film entry I wanted to ask you about was True Grit, uh, the Coen Brothers. I've I've had a, <laughs> a bunch of guests that were in Coen Brothers movies, right? And I've heard that when they have a script, they want it, you know, they want that thing. Word for word, the way they they they've written it down. Um, I had a guest that was in uh, Old Brother, um, uh, uh, the old, the Old Brother movie. Uh, what now? The, what what yeah. they you know the the, the enunciations are done almost precise. Um, talk about your experience. What, what a wonderful movie, by the way. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. They they were an extraordinary extraordinary job. And Haley was Haley was amazing. Matt was amazing. I mean, everybody was just so 
it was so good. It was such a it was such a pleasure just seeing something that was such a smart adaptation of of the novel as as as, as great and iconic as you know the John Wayne version is of of its time and 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 watching Glenn Campbell is an absurd delight in that um that 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 they did they 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 I think that the brothers unique gifts were perfectly suited to uh to true grit and and what they what they did with it um and it just really came together and and it was a, it was a great experience for me um uh, just on on so many so many levels you know there was the very sentimental one of you know here's these iconic filmmakers and artists who are from st louis park so they're like just the north suburb over and i always kind of like wondered if i'd ever really have the opportunity to um you know to work with it if that would even be a a reality um because I've always been a huge, a huge fan of their, their work. Um, and then just the practical thing of, of going down there, because I didn't, I actually didn't meet them until I was on the set. Wow. It was all, it was all just done. It was all just done remotely um, with um, self taping. It was like one of the earlier kind of self tape things put to put together. I wasn't in LA at the time. And they didn't even know that. And, you know, so they had actually asked if we could meet on the Paramount lot, like the day after Christmas. And I was like, yeah, I think so. I just, I have to figure out like flights that might be a little tight. And they were just mortified. They were like, no, 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 no. We don't get on a flight just for this. You know, just um, how about, you know, we'll, we'll figure something else out. They just wanted to give a couple of notes. Um, so the first time I met them was just down on on set as we were doing as we were doing the setups and 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 trying to see how everything was was going to be. And it was just so hot. It was just it was we were shooting in late spring and we were we were down like outside of Austin. And it was that that late spring, just really just humid. And the prior shooting for this they were having just no luck with like the weather and with getting things right. Like they were having problems with the river scenes. Like they were like the snow was melting at the wrong time and they were having to like, like fix things. I was just hearing like nothing, but God, can we get one thing right on this? And so that was kind of like the atmosphere of like, you know, you kind of hear like the groundworks of like, Oh boy, we're really trying to, stick with this because not it's not supposed to be this hot now and that's something that you always underestimate because this is like things that like happen on twister and and a scent of a woman is where weather and just like very elemental things can be you just can't get around as much as you want to control and how much those things can those things can inform you know the dynamics of the shoot and how things are going to turn out because you have such a large collection of people led hopefully by the director and the producer of how we're going to respond to these these obstacles um so when we were shooting like the brothers they loved everything to be super authentic and period so it was like 102 and 100 percent humidity and everybody had on wool long underwear and it was wool cotton wool like three, four layers. <laughs> and so it was just so hot. Oh, and boy. we had ex- we had extras falling over and they had EMTs off to the side, like, you know, rehabilitating them and and giving them, you know, the saline drips. It was just, it was, there was something bizarrely dramatic going on. But they were always absolutely calm and supportive and like, we're gonna get this. And and watching the two of them talk and then work with Roger Deakins, who shot it. Which was, and that was the thing is, is that I can't believe that like Roger Deakins is shooting something that I'm doing. Yeah. I, 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 I'm just like, oh my God. And that you're right. They, they are very specific, um, to the script and, and, the, and the text that it's, it's word for word. But the thing is, is like the writing is so good, at, at least for myself and other friends of mine who 
like worked with the brothers is like the writing is so good and it it makes so much sense that it's like it's not hard to learn and to love and embrace you know yeah it, it's like you just you just get it there's other projects where it's like oh, i wish i could change this because i'm just not feeling it i'm, I'm having a hard time getting there and and that can happen on stage it can happen just in anything um except for sometimes you, you when you do get this work that is just so strong on the page that you just know just learn it and follow it yeah and and get out of your way and and so to film with them especially it was because they set it up to be at a very like they wanted it all in one take because they were doing this kind of sweeping it was like this kind of boom shot and then a push in and they wanted to get it all in one so then everything that was happening in the scene you know we had to just get it and not wanting it to break so there was that pressure and thrill of don't muck this up because you don't want to be the jackass is the reason for okay back to one hmm. yeah. yeah and and so that was a thrill that was that was fun and to watch and to be be a part of that and and the most interesting dynamic in terms of direction with them is they would come up and give direction separately so ethan would come up and then he would very quietly like tell me what he would want and then you do a take and then joel would come up and then he would tell me the exact opposite <laughs> and I was like okay it's like am i doing it right and it's like no no, no it's just let's do it that way let's see what happens and it's like so do that and then there, it, it was almost like this head game. It was always completely opposite of like what they were asking of like what to try to find with, with all of these, you know, different, different takes. And it, it was, it was just thrilling. And they were just, they were just so, they were just so cool. And they were so, they're so smart and so just so smart um, that there was one thing that, that Roger really wanted to get of the timing of the sun over the building of the gallows and the way that they we were trying to get this. And Roger said, you know, we're not going to get it. And, and, you know, a lot of directors would just say, well, it's good enough. We have it. But they trust Roger and say, so we should come back like tomorrow. Right. And I was supposed to wrap, but we were like doing everything. And they were like, no, we should, we should, keep and do this tomorrow. And that's exactly what they did. They said, do you mind sticking around? I was like, I'll stay for as long as you want. Yeah. You know? And so, so we reset up just specifically to get that one, you know, that one pass and, and moment within the long take that Roger saw and that he wanted in the composition and, you know, and to be able to, to be in real time on a, on a set, you know, on location, you know, not in, in, in a completely controlled environment like a studio, but, you know, you are, you are in the, in the elements watching people at the very top of their game work and collaborate and, and have inspiration and, and solve things. And it, it was just really it, just a real privilege, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And, and who, a, who's going to argue with Roger hard. Deakins, right? Nick, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, the last thing I'll ask you about, um, and, and uh, you know, I have to say, this movie changed my life in so many ways. Right, I saw it in the theater probably 250 times ever since. It's in my top five without question. I think I've seen quite a bit of movies. Um, it is *Scent of a Woman*. Um, what <laughs> a phenomenal movie for such a variety of reasons that hopefully we could touch on briefly. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I have to say, like when I say movie, like so, this is in the very for me the very kind of shallow, very. There's not many movies in this category, right? I would put in the same ballpark as Shawshank, Green Mile, a few others. It's it's in rarefied air. Uh, boy, it's one of the best movies ever made. Um, how did you come to this part? Because Harry Havemeyer has been a legend in my mind forever. Um, <laughs> you know, I, and I'm not just patronizing. I'm telling you, man, I have I have such high regard for this movie. I have such high regard for the cast, for Martin Brest. I have such, this movie affects me on so many levels. Um, how'd you get the part and just talk about your way into the front door, into this movie? Oh gosh. I'm it's well. And also Bo Goldman who adapted it from, from the Italian film. Yeah. Phenomenal uh, writer. Yes. Yep. But you know, and Bo, you know, Bo's extraordinary. 
And um, and I'm actually, it sounds like such a name dropper thing to do, but but Bo's um, son-in-law, um, Todd Field, is one of my closest friends, and we actually bonded and became friends um, over Scent of a Woman um, because the Todd couldn't, he wasn't uh, he wasn't a part of it, but his father, you know, his father-in-law wrote it, but you know, he couldn't get an audition, and he was just like in a very Todd way, was very much. Um, <laughs> Um, celebratory and 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 uh, I what's the word? He, he was just very cool, but he is we we bonded over it, like you got that and you lucky bastard. <laughs> um, but uh, but I mean I got it. I was I had done I had done um, mobsters and which was a unit film for universal and that they were the, the studio was very high on me at that time, which at least like put me on certain, um, just on certain lists and on certain radars with people within the studio and then with, with casting directors. And so I was fortunate enough that, that Alan Lewis wanted to, um, wanted to see me. And so I, I read for, I read for Ellen and then they, they, I read for, for, for Charlie and then they started bringing me back, um, not for, not for Harry, but for, um, um, oh God, I'm completely blanking on, on Phil's character's name. Um, I can't remember it right now, but anyway, um, I started reading, you know, reading for that as well. And then I was put on tape and then I heard that, that, you know, Martin wanted to, you know, maybe, and then it was just a series of auditions over, over a number of, of, of months. It was funny because it was, it started in Los Angeles and then the casting was happening in, in New York. And at the time I was in, I was living in New York, but I was, also living in Los Angeles. I was kind of doing that straddling, that straddling thing. And they, um, they had a, a, a group of us in New York doing the screen tests with Al Pacino, which was just that in its, like if it ended right there, I would have been like the happiest person in the world because I'm sitting here where they did the screen test live. I think it was three blocks from the office where I was doing my bike messengering not three, not even three years earlier, two years earlier. Wow. And here I am like in this, in this place. And it was the first time that I met Phil and we were both smokers at the time. And I remember bumming a Marlboro red from him and just being just nervous as all hell because we're all getting ready to, you know, read and do this and, and, and meet Al Pacino. I remember meeting him and just how firm and thick and warm his hands were in his handshake. It was just the most extraordinary thing. And Marty was just always just super, just very loose and encouraging. And we did the screen tests. And then after that, they, we just kind of had to hang around. And then we found out that there were like four of us were going to go over to Ellen's, was it Ellen's office or was it Marty's office? Um, further, further uptown, um, that they wanted to do some improvs and just Marty just wanted to see, you know, kind of, I guess nowadays they would call it a chemistry test. Then it was just, then we just want to see like how it all kind of like who maybe works together. And you may read this, you may read Charlie, you may do, you might be Harry, you might be Trent, you know, whatever. And so we were doing that. And everybody there was New York. They had this perception that I was like Los Angeles based. And I was like, no, no, my, my apartment's like 10 blocks away. Um, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm here and, and I can be a local hire and like whatever it takes, you know, to do this. Cause they were under this perception of, Oh, he's this, this actor is going to end up being a Los Angeles actor. Cause like Chris was, Chris was considered Los Angeles, even though he was still living in Chicago at the time. Um, you know, so you hear these whisperings of stuff and, you know, in your head, you can think just enough, oh, my God, am I not going to get this because they don't want to fly me from Los Angeles? It's like, it's OK. I, I'm, I'm not that I, I'm, I'm here. I can I can do this. Um, 
but I got a feeling that like after like the improvs and working all together, it seemed like Marty was, Marty was pretty happy, but you know, the things can change because you never know, well, who's like the next people that we don't know that they're going to be, that they're going to be seeing. Um, and it, it all happened. It was funny because like the audition process up to the improvs was a very long period. And then after the improvs, it moved pretty quickly after that, that it was like, we're, we're going to be doing this and, and all the sense of, you know, shooting schedules and, and, and how we're going to rehearse. And, and, and it was again, just very, you know, wonderfully disorienting that allowed just within the bubble of working just to be grounded because it's like at the time when you're doing something like this and you're so young, there's really no sense of, because God knows you don't want to be sitting there going, Hey, I'm doing the important film and look at my important acting. Cause we know we've all kind of sat and slowly killed ourselves watching those kinds of movies that there was just, here's a group of people that are going to do something really well and it's fresh. And we're just happy that we're, we're doing this. You know, and and that was very much the case, you know. And then, geez, when we started, I mean, talk about weather. Weather comes up a lot with a lot of films of my, <laughs> that I've been lucky enough to work on. Is that we shot up at the Emma Willard School, and at the same time, they were shooting, um, they were shooting the Age of Innocence um, up the road there in in Troy. They were doubling it in the same manner in which they're usually actually the same places that um, for now they're doing the Gilded Age, HBO is doing the Gilded Age, um, they're using that same area up in Troy, right? Yep. And so we knew, like, Martin Scorsese is, like, he's 15 miles away, and Martin Brest is here, and, like, you know, there's, like, all these big films happening. Um, but when we were at Emma Willard, which was, which, which was you know, substituting for, for Baird, um, and it's supposed to be fall, the day before we were supposed to start shooting, we got this freak early fall blizzard. Mm. And it's like, it dumped three feet of snow. And we're supposed to, you know, we were supposed to shoot exteriors. And then we ended up going in and scrambling to do interiors while they were trying to think, well, can we make this winter? Because it all supposed to take place. Is it now a, a snowy Thanksgiving? And then that snow melted but it blew all the leaves off the trees. And so it's like, okay, do we put the leaves back on the trees? There was just, there were so many things that were stopping and starting at the beginning of it that were just, that had nothing to do with us or the acting. It was all these like learning early. It's like, this is filmmaking, weird things happen. And how do you correct this? Especially because this is before CGI where you could just go in and, and, and paint a correction. Um, that there was so much stuff going on bef before we were even just kind of getting into the work. But then the work itself was just amazing because Marty being somebody who loved improv, you know, just the polar opposite of the, the Coen brothers. Yes. Even yeah. though you had a phenomenal script mm -hmm. by Bo Goldman, Marty would always say, all right, one for you. And he would just go around one for you. You know, he always just used to say to Phil, Phil, my boy, one for you. <laughs> and, and so we would all kind of be able to get in and, and, and riff and kind of keep it fresh and, and have those, you know, and have those connections. And so you'd have these wonderful long takes that you, you would just follow Bo's words and, and the structure that he set up. And then knowing within that, you'd have the confidence of, you know, go ahead and trying something. And that, you know, you just knowing that that was encouraged and, and it was really celebrated. And it was just really, it was just that kind of, again, when that sense of community comes together and it comes from like the top down, having someone like Marty set that tone on a set, it's just infectious for, for everyone in, involved that, that you don't realize until later just how, just, just how lucky you are to be a part of something like that. Yeah. And, and, and it, that it goes beyond is like, okay, we're doing another take. That's right. Remember that the, the sandbag marker is there at the corner of that part of the sidewalk. That's right. That's right. Okay. Oh, wait, yeah, yeah, we're going, we're going back and, Oh, that's right. Todd's going to add that line. And then Phil's going to do, okay. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, okay. We're, you know, 
and all the stuff that you do where you're staying like in the moment to like make something to then step back and see it and go like, Oh my goodness, look at, look at how all this came, came together. It was also more, it was so generous. It was like, it was one of the first times I was able to watch editing at, at, at that level and scale of like, he invited us in that he was, he was cutting together one of the scenes set in New York and just like watching, watching, you know, all the flatbeds are there and like in the old, like you're still cutting. This is, we're not, we're not quite to avid and, and digitizing and, you know, light years away from where we are now. I'm just watching them do this and playing back and Marty turning and saying, well, what do you think? What, what do you think of that? Is it, is it this one or is that one, you know, and turning to these scrubs and, and really asking of like, and, and, and in a very, in a, in a very thoughtful and, and sincere, sincere way, you know, to be, to being open, open to that. It's just really amazing. Just, just, just extraordinary. Yeah, and, and I, th- I think that I think that informs a lot of of why that movie resonates and is so evergreen that that it, that it is for so many people um, just a go to film that that it's it's a it's a film that's a certain destination on one's path that becomes like a marker and to be a part of something like that is just like you know it, it's you know it, it, it's it's humbling. Um, and just to know all the the work, but like the love and the care that went into it. And I, I think that there is without being like super crunchy or something or hippy dippy about it. But I mean, I, I think that there are things when, when work is infused with that, it can't help but hold on to. And it's, and it is captured. And I think it's one of the things that, that makes it the, the special, the special film that, that it is. And that, and, you know, and from, you know, from the score, to to everything you know to al's generosity and and just the fact that it was kind of the culmination point of of such a personal hero and a professional hero like al pacino who had these 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 amazing films and then needed to take some time away and it was having a quiet time in his life and then all of a sudden to start you know i guess you call it a comeback but you know, all of a sudden it's like stepping back into the work and then all of a sudden being a part of that ride and seeing somebody, you know, really embrace this opportunity, to, you know, to 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 reinvest in himself and, and rediscover himself and, and to be able to work with someone like that at that at that caliber. Yeah. You know, and, and have somebody like Al Pacino yell at you and <laughs> say what he's to you. You know, to have that in a film, it's like that's that's just that's just you know that's ice cream and icing and gravy. I mean, it's just like yeah, you, know, well, you said a bunch of things. Tell me people get their head ripped off by Al Pacino like that. So it's like, <laughs> so so please. yeah, you, you said a lot here that I want to kind of touch on quickly. You know, the the, the, sure, sure. the, the head the, the the Al Pacino ripping into you. You are so unbelievably awesome in that scene, right? Because in that. <laughs> That 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 epilogue, that monologue that he gives is it's one of the best moments in movie history. I dare somebody to to, to say otherwise. He says, you know, in, in the midst of it, he he calls out Harry, Trent, Jimmy. There's a look on your face that you're like re- like almost like he's ready to kind of just give you guys some props or some respect. And then he drops the and F you too. Like it is one of the <laughs> coolest moments in movie history. It truly is, Nick. Oh, thanks. Yeah, and, and, you know, and, and you mentioned the score. The fact that Thomas Newman wasn't nominated for that's a joke. Um, there's a shot. Uh, of I agree. That, there, there's a shot that uh, of the four of you on the internet that makes me really makes me like nostalgic. I love it. It makes me sad because of Philip, but it's just a great shot of the four of you. And, and, and I've had um, Austin Pendleton on the show. And he raves yeah. about Philip Seymour Hoffman, and I think they got the casting right. They got the casting perfect, I should say, um, with this movie. And you know, yeah. w- w- when you rewatch it, because I know you have your own son today, um, w- when you rewatch it, uh, I'm curious: Have you ever rewatched this movie with your son? Because I think he's probably close to the age that these guys were supposed to have been in the ballpark. I'm guessing. But this, this, yeah, he's getting like, well, yeah, my son uh, is uh, is fifteen. So close, um, he's close, he's close so to yeah, yeah. We're 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 getting there, and we watched it for the first time 
it was it was last it was last year. Wow. You know, very and cool. So he got a he got a real, you know, he got a real real kick out of it, you know. And he he's but forever he had like but he had seen scenes of the movie of me in it on YouTube, like this generation does. They grab everything like on like clips and and, and bits off of YouTube first before before anything. But you know, but he's he's been mocking me as Harry Havemeyer since I think he was like five or six years old. <laughs> That's so great. That is such a great dad son moment. Um, <laughs> you, and Harry is totally the ringleader here. But it is really a beautiful movie, right? Because where we're both uh, Pacino and, and Chris start off, you know. Frank Slade, and my take is, and you, you you can say what you want, but Frank Slade is a guy that's hurt by life, let down by people, angry, depressed, suicidal. Then we see Charlie, like he's in this, he's almost out, a, a fish out of water. He's in his, he's in a league of people he probably shouldn't be in with, right? He's got the, the mm-hmm. group of friends we mentioned that are, that are going to be at that school and they're fine no matter what, where Charlie's probably overachieving uh, to the 10th degree, right? Um, and, and, and it's just, it's just a situation where, the relationship they form, the bond they have. I feel like Charlie evolves into this beacon of light and hope that Frank absolutely admires and loves, right? He sees integrity that's absent everywhere else. And I think that's what he, he totally expects him to flip on you guys, to turn you guys, and he just will not do it. He's got that integrity that's long lost. And I think that's my perception of the film. Am I way off with that, Nick? Am I, am I partial to that? No, no, I think, I think, I think you're very insightful. In, in that regard, and it just reminded me again of one of the things that that Todd Field and I bonded over is that a lot of Charlie is based on Todd's stories of growing up in Oregon, yeah, and used a lot of of Todd um, is is infused in Charlie, and so absolutely from um, from just a a character narrative perspective in terms of stories i think you're you're absolutely you know right right on there and i would i would never presume to speak for for chris and his choices and just very smartly watching how he shaped the character and and marty guiding as he kind of helped all of us you know to do that is is yeah i mean it's a real it's an it's an early lesson that many never learn in their life of what is, you know, what are values and, and what do we, what do we stand for? What, you know, at, at risk of losing what we think is important and, and how we really choose to, you know, define our lives, you know, and, and, and our souls or spirits or whatever one wishes to, to call them, you know, and, and, there's so much that Charlie does have to go through in terms of what I think his journey of what I think a lot of kids go through um, is what makes me, what's going to make me my, that the, the dream me, you know, I don't want to use a word as shallow as successful because it's like it's more than that. It's like we're all aspirational that we think we're going to find like our way and our fit. And if we do the right things, then that will lead us to the the right place. And and, you know, some of us get those lessons earlier than others on having those assumptions challenged and maybe not seeing what's on the other side, but knowing that the path that you're on can't be the one that you stay on yeah. without knowing where, where things go, go next. So, yeah, I think, I think you're right on with, with that. And I think, I think Chris did a really wonderful job, especially because it was very smartly done. And I think it's one of the reasons that it sticks so well is the, the result is not foregone. There's nothing, there's nothing cleanly heroic going going from a a to z you know that there's there's a lot of you know doubt and uncertainty and and because these are these are you know big you know these are these are 
big things needing to be decided, you know, because they, they, they are of, they are of consequence. Yeah. And the looks you give really fuel that movie, right? I mean, even when he's interrupting at the end during the whole, that whole final scene, um, the the looks that you give, I mean, I've had this conversation with tons of actors about, you know, acting is so much more than just dialogue, right? And I feel like you yeah. exemplify that in this movie, right? There's so many times where Frank Slate is just, he's just driving home, like he's interrupting, he's swearing, and the looks on your face are, it's, it's, it's priceless, you know? And, and, and the fact that Charlie is truly Frank's redemption really is a beautiful part of this. Uh, two final questions. Thank you for all this time. Sure. Um, I've been working, um, working on a special episode, um, about Martin Brest, you know, that, that's going to, for for 2022 i can't figure oh. i can't figure out this um career like i hold this man in such high regard um it's meet joe black it's the uh epic scent of a woman it's midnight run beverly hills cop the majority of his like eight directorial entries in, in imdb are just phenomenal movies and then nick he kind of just disappears i don't understand it, it. I, I i i feel like he has so much to offer us as, as fame. Like he's just such a wonderfully gifted man. And the fact that he's kind of just, and, and maybe it's for other reasons. I I don't know. I don't know, but I, I hold this man in such high regard. I love his work. And, and quite truthfully, without sounding sappy, I miss the guy. Yeah. <laughs> I miss him. You know, I miss him. I miss him too. You know, and it, it, you know, it's a strange, you know, I would never assume to, to speak or try to get into anyone's, had you know he's so generous and and creative and exacting in the most wonderful of ways um it takes a lot of energy it takes it takes so much to be that giving and creative and and i think you know and i've been fortunate to work with other filmmakers as well that that need longer time to regenerate or find that thing that they want to do and be be happy with it um you know they're so yeah i, I you know i get a little tongue tied because i would i would never again presume to speak for 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 anyone or or know why he would not want to work more i know that he loves working and collaborating with Bo. um yeah i don't yeah. i don't know i do wish that i do wish that he would make more movies but i can completely understand why there would be significant time between between projects and a lot of it you know i see it with 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 friends who get so close and I've been involved with projects that they look like they're going to go and then they don't, you know, and that have nothing to do with the quality of the work. There's, there's so much that has to do with scheduling and weirdness and the way financing is set up at certain like budget thresholds that have certain demands that, that in some ways it's, it is. It sounds cliche, but it is a true miracle that anything ever gets gets done. You know, yeah. it, and in some ways, for as much opportunity there is to churn out things into this content machine that's been created, it's in many ways harder than ever to actually get something to get something through. Um, Especially, especially things that are of a certain um, character-driven, you know, it gets it's 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 tricky. It's a tricky it's a tricky mix. I mean, I I wish he would make, I wish he would, but I I I can certainly understand and appreciate why perhaps he's not. Yeah, and my last question too is: I know you teach acting. A big a big point that people listen to the podcast, uh, big fans of acting or actors themselves. Um, what has being a parent taught you about teaching acting to people? Right. Cause I always feel like, you know, <laughs> you're, you're very proud of, you know, your son. And I feel like parenthood always gives us new insight and perspective. We never would have had before, um, without sounding over the top. Has there, and has there been something you've learned from being a parent, um, that you 
that you bring to your students, right? Put aside the Juilliard, put aside your, your wonderful ability, all that aside. Is there something you learned as a parent that's really helped you in dealing with other people and students and so forth? Um, I'll make sure there's always snacks. Um, <laughs> no, that's, that's glib. Um, uh, patience, perhaps I would, I would have guessed, but that, that would have been, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, there is, I honestly, I think if anything from being a parent that would translate for, for being a, a good, I mean, I want to say good teacher, but I, I think ho hopefully a serviceable one to being a guide, I think is the amount of what you hold back and don't do. And that the, have the confidence that, that who's in front of you is going to find it and is going to discover it and has it within themselves. And I think, I think in being a, parent is maddening and it is and you know there's so many different there's there's you know we are so hands-on to where you're getting the message hands off extremely you know <laughs> is is finding this you know where it is to just let it breathe mm -hmm. let just let it you know and and to create probably like without being precious, but just an honestly creating, creating safety. Mm. Safety will always nourish confidence because, because then, you know, that, that you can, you can be, you can be bold without fear of comfort, you know, of the consequence of, of rejection or feeling less than, which we all are going to feel that, naturally but at least knowing that it's okay it's it's okay and you know try again you mm, know mm. what is it ne more never failed try again yeah that's failed that that, that's a, that's a fantastic answer like, like that's something that like anybody that's looking to take acting like that's I mean, if you don't feel safe in the zone you're in forget it like it's it's game over right i mean you're, you're never going to be yourself yeah, because most of the most of the great stuff that when it happens after the fact, it was like, God, I never thought of that. Where'd that come from? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, you know, it, because there's and, and it's just creating space and like and with trying to be a good parent, you know, there's just you get to a point where there's like you end up being the Charlie Brown adult where it's <laughs> you know <laughs> you just that just becomes white noise yeah where you just have to set back and it's a, it's like it's just kind of a question of timing of just like when are you you know in some ways you know i think good parenting and perhaps being a good teacher is like knowing when to be scotty pippen you know <laughs> it's just like you know just light touch on the ball and move it along yeah and yeah. magical things will 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 happen and to find a way to you know make the make make it light and warm from the shadows yeah. and 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 keep the focus on the work you right. know and just keep it safe keep it cool yeah that's a great answer uh, before i let you go anything you wanted to promote throw out there you've been so much fun to talk to is there anything you <laughs> you have coming out for you or go you know what, what anything you want to throw out there please the floor is yours oh gosh no nothing nothing right now i'm in i'm in development hell so i'm and i'm i'm horribly superstitious so okay I'm, i don't talk about anything I'm, I'm i'm one of those nutters so um you know i'm i'm just grateful you know that that we get opportunities like this to to talk to eric you know people who love film and love creating this is just awesome you know and and that's you know there's so many people who are not happy or feel a sense of purpose in what they're doing and, and just be able to do something like have a moment or two to do this, you know, it's just really freaking cool. Oh, that's great. Thank man. you for creating this for me tonight. Yeah, no. And, and you know, your work has changed my life. Sent a woman alone outside of your other <laughs> awesome filmographies has seriously changed my life. And it has been that way for 30 years plus. And, I can't thank you enough, man. You're you're a really talented guy, and, and and thank you for your kindness, your time, and all that other good stuff. 
Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. And, and best luck with everything. And, and you, you're making a difference, like giving like people an opportunity to get insights from people, people smart, far, far smarter than me. This is really cool. So I, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, all of this and, 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 and hearing it and, and sharing it. Thank you for listening to Derek Thomas and Monday Morning Critic Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, you can also connect with Monday Morning Critic on Instagram and Facebook, MDM Critic on Twitter, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are found. All episodes available, www.mmcpodcast.com.